Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week's gone well. Um, let me start with some macro thoughts because there's so much going on now. U.S. stock futures slid on Trump's latest trade move, escalates trade tensions with call for new China tariffs. Um, and currently the uh, U.S. market is down 235 points. Um, I still feel that it's very much uh, Trump's blunderbuss versus uh, China's uh, surgeon's scalpel. They're hitting him really hard where it hurts consistently. This is the illustration in China's Global Times stock market squeeze, and definitely uh, equity, uh, equity markets, U.S. equity markets are caught in the crossfire. And if he keeps on escalating, uh, um, uh, you're going to find further pressure on these markets. And uh, that's the point. Uh, equities are in the crossfire, plain and simple. Simulations of trade war in the 21st century. Um, take a look at this article by Alessandro Lucita, Marcello Olariaga, and Perry de Silva. And uh, basically, the outcome is not good. Um, I remember interviewing Standard Chartered uh, Trade Finance head, and he was saying that if you look back at the last fully fledged trade tariff war, um, it locked a huge amount of GDP. Turkey's currency has tumbled to a historic low. Um, over the past three decades, the Turkish lira has only ever traded weaker than four versus the dollar on five trading days, all of which were after March the 22nd, 2018. It would be interesting, in my view, to know the Gulf's position because they had been in the habit of depositing large amounts in the money markets. And I'm sure there's been very heavy-duty capital flight, in part um, to buttress the geopolitical uh, uh, angle key to put pressure on Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states. Um, after all, Turkey bailed out the Emir of Qatar because I think at that moment they were seriously considering an invasion before he sent in, I think, about 3,000 of his uh, crack troops. Home thought Zoroastrian ancient winter festival, Cham in Yazid province, Iran, Silk Road. Um, the Iranians, before there were Muslims, were Zoroastrians, and actually there is a small community of Parsis, I don't know if you've ever heard of that very small community, and they too are, are Zoroastrian and fire worshippers. There's a fantastic writer called Rohinta Mystery, who I'm sure is a Parsi. Faber Books tweeted from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. It's long poem, but I'm just going to read a few bits and pieces. You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Yet when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet. Madame Sosostris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold, nevertheless is known to be the wisest woman in Europe, with a wicked pack of cards. Here, said she, is your card, the drowned Phoenician sailor. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Look, here is Belladonna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man with three staves, and here the wheel, and here is the one-eyed merchant, and this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man, fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking around in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. It's a great poem, he's a great poet. And, uh, 
find myself falling into his style of recitation because I've been listening to him on YouTube, T.S. Eliot. All over the world, the past was being wiped out by condominiums. This is Elmore Leonard, who's a great crime writer, um, and I enjoy reading him. Political Reflections, Siri, what does the collapse of the US-led regional order look like? This is Karl Remarx. It's a very witty wag on Twitter. Breaking, disgraced South Korean President Park Yun hee sentenced to 24 years in jail, according to Yonhap News Agency. That's quite something. Self-respecting adults don't believe in fairy tales, says Sergei Lavrov, as he calls the UK handling of the Skripal case an open mockery of international law. Then, in response, the UK ambassador to the UN, Russia's request to play a part in the Salisbury nerve agent probe is like an arsonist investigating its own fire. She said just ahead of today's meeting that allowing Russian scientists into an investigation when they are the most likely perpetrators of the crime in Salisbury would be like Scotland Yard inviting in Professor Moriarty. So I don't think that's a tenable way forward. The Russian ambassador to the UN addressed the UK's accusations against his country. Couldn't you come up with a better fake news story? We have told our British colleagues that you're playing with fire and you'll be sorry. He pointed to the television program Midsummer Murders and read from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to mock suggestions of Russian involvement. He also claimed the UK's main argument about the unquestionable Russian origin of the Novichok is no longer valid. Following comments from the Porton Down Laboratory, where UK Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson said the Novichok agent came from Russia, the uh, Russian uh, ambassador of the year then accused the West at large of using the method of Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels' lies that are repeated a thousand times become the truth by trying to manipulate people via the media. A US representative to the UN, Kelly Curry, said tersely, this is not a tactic that is appropriate for this body. I got in uh, a sort of Twitter exchange with China Handle I follow, it's a very interesting uh, Twitter handle, and um, he's highly skeptical that this was a Russian-inspired um, uh, uh, poisoning, and I asked, you don't think that to lie about it, because obviously the UK has fallen in this regard, Iraq war refers. I said, you, don't, you do not think to lie about it would be unconscionable post Tony Blair's Iraq fiasco, um, a la the boy who cried wolf. And eventually, no one believes you about anything in these matters. And I also said, if you look, the Kremlin, in my view, has now positioned so many assets on their payroll, um, you know, abroad, and if you look at the donations Russians seem to be given very good value for money, by the way. I mean, they look, they spent money through the NRA on Trump's campaign. They're financing a lot of um, anti-European parties in Europe. Boris Johnson himself was being financed, it seems. Um, so I'm saying what he's done over the last 10 years is place you know, significant assets uh, across the chessboard. Um, and I'm saying you know, having positioned all these assets. Now, he's spoken about these sort of renegade spies before in a very fruity language. This is Putin. Um, he used the same language for the terrorists in Chechnya. Um, and then even worse, I suppose, than what he feels about the terrorists is what he feels about intelligence assets that then are turn, turncoat. Um, so I think you know his opinion around an individual who sold out more than 400 positioned intelligence assets is going to be an opinion not higher than vermin. Um, 
uh, in my view. Um, in 1999, at the beginning of the Chechen military campaign, Mr. Putin promised to flush the terror terrorists down the toilet. What in the election, in fact, in that kind of language. On that note, this is Grozny, Chechnya, August 1995. Chechens celebrating peace. The photograph is by Thomas de Borzak. And then a photograph of executions, Prospect Pobody in Grozny, November 1995, Chechen Republic, Russia, Stanley Green for Noor. Powerful photographs. Putin, traitors will kick the bucket. Trust me, these people betrayed their friends, their brothers in arms. This is what I mean about, you know, if it's a continuum, these are the worst of the worst. Um, which all leads me to believe that in this particular regard, although it's a, it's a typically Surkov type situation of destabilized perception, which is evidenced by this, both guinea pigs were found dead while the cat needed to be put down, Salisbury attack. Then uh, Bloomberg View is talking of uh, beware of a cyber war with Russia. Putin has proven he will retaliate, trying to get this calibration right of something that is just disruptive enough that it throws off the Russian game, but not so severe that they feel they need to come back heavier, is what needs to happen. The problem is that Putin has won the contest of what military planners call escalation dominance for now. He proved he was willing to go further in 2016 than the established cyber contest, contest between the US and Russia. In some ways, Russia already showed it was willing to go beyond previously established understandings of cyber warfare when in 2014 hackers made public a recording of a phone call of former US Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland, who was actually far more powerful than the title might suggest talking with the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piet. None of this is an excuse for inaction. Russia's troll farms and hackers should be probed and disrupted. State voting system should be hardened before the midterm elections. When cyber warfare is complicated, there are honest reasons the Trump administration would want to proceed carefully so as not to escalate a cyber war with Russia. 5th of December 2016, I was writing about this and I used the quotation, we have a deviate tomahawk, and I concluded by saying that Putin has proven himself an information master and his adversaries are his information victims, which seems to me to be the point that Bloomberg View is also making. Finally, meeting with China's Chinese president's special envoy, Wang Yi, uh, this was yesterday, uh, development of Russia-China relations. Let's move on to international markets. Deutsche Bank yesterday said about Facebook, cautiously optimistic, the bottom is in. We hit my target, which was 150. And now we're back at 156.61. And I think you can be comfortable selling rebounds, but I think one has to look at 160 to 161 to get short again. Essentially, I don't disagree with what I wrote on the 26th of March when I said sell Facebook, the man in the hoodie, is a sweatshirt without a hood. With a hood, Mark Zuckerberg is hopelessly behind the curve and he continues to be uh, behind the curve. Facebook says data on most of its 2 billion users could have been accessed improperly. That's their business. It was to facilitate the access to data on Facebook in order to monetize the business. Um, and the question is whether we've now entered, a, entered an existential crisis when people wake up and realize They've been hawking everyone's deepest fears and uh, desires to advertisers and political uh, advertisers. Given the scale and sophistication of their activity, we've seen, we believe most people on Facebook could have had their public profile scraped in this way. So we have now disabled this feature, they said. US 10 year bond yield is seen in this chart from Bloomberg. A lot of people looking for 3% in the very least. Currency markets, euro, dollar, 122.32, dollar index, 90.47, Japanese yen, 107.37, Swiss franc, 0.9631, the pound, 140.05, the Australian dollar, 0.7680, India rupee, 65.105, South Korean won, 1068.92, 
The Rial 33449, Egyptian pound 17.6915. And the Rand has popped over 12 to 12.0478. General theme the last 24 hours is a stronger dollar, to be honest, particularly dollar yen. Dollar index, this is a chart from T Commodity. I'm still sticking with the 88 stop. We're moving further away from it, so that's good. Euro versus the dollar, 122.33 last. 125.60, which is overhead resistance, is also a triple top. Some analysts have noted the parallels between the dot-com bubble and Bitcoin's recent rise and fall. We'll take a look at this from Wall Street Journal Markets, practically a mirror image. Gold, last trading at $1,325. We've been in quite a range for quite a while, actually, if you think about it. 1355, 1365 is capped it, and then we've found strong support uh, around the 1300 level. Crude oil, $63.14. Uh, uh, that's mid range as well. We've got as high as about 66, I think, as low as 60. We're in that, we're exactly in the middle. Uh, Turkish lira, as we said earlier, hit fresh lows as key minister goes missing. Uh, weakened as much as 1.2% against the dollar to 4.0468 after Hurriyet newspaper reported Simsek may have resigned, trimmed some of its losses as Simsek said he would continue serving the nation until our last breath. Which is Erdoganian in its language. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed makes a promising start. That's Africa Conference. Expectations are high that the youthful new Oromo Prime Minister can be a unifying force. He's even trying to reconcile with Eritrea. Indeed, the ruling party took a promising step towards greater stability when it elected Abiy Ahmed the head of its Oromia wing as its new chairperson and Prime Minister on 27th March. Young family as well. And I conclude by saying, is this the required course correction? The Prime Minister, in my view, certainly saying the right things. And I go, the reason I use that phrase was in October 2016, when we had the first state of emergency, I was saying that the government needs to change tack and effect a course correction. And history shows us that this course correction is one of the most difficult things to pull off. Certainly, uh, language, um, uh, what he's saying, uh, pointing us in the right direction. But, you know, there's a deep state behind it. U.S. military grounds aircraft in Djibouti after multiple accidents. At the request of officials there, the East African country is a critical location in the fight against terrorism. Following those accidents, the Djiboutian government sent the U.S. a diplomatic notice requesting that all flying operations be halted. There are about 4,000 U.S. personnel in Djibouti based at Camp Lemonnier, and U.S. forces there support military operations against the terrorist group Al-Shabaab in neighboring Somalia. But you will recall, not too long ago, U.S. officials have been raising the alarm bigly about China's growing influence in Djibouti. Um, and uh, if you look at a map, you'll see that Djibouti is like a cockpit on one of the most important sea lanes in the world. Uh, in this photograph, uh, MV-22 Osprey is preparing to land at a landing zone in Djibouti. August uh, 2017, I wrote about recently how we saw China formally open a military facility in Djibouti. And I said, when you looked at all the moves together, Djibouti, Guada port, and a lot more I was writing about, there's a link there, that it's a material Chinese advance, I said. The Indian Ocean, which borders Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Australia, is home to major sea lanes and choke points that are crucial to global trade. This is the point China is pushing back, not only the South China Sea, which is largely, in my view, a fait accompli, but they're also pushing back in the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, so from Sri Lanka's Hanban Tota port, which China has snuffled up for 99 years, to Gwadar port in Pakistan's Baluchistan, to Djibouti, to Maldives, and surely soon somewhere in East Africa, China is growing its geopolitical footprint. According to Africa Confidential, the UK is leaning towards President Mnangagwa. Britain may be breaking ranks with donors and creditors over conditions 
for restoring Harari's access to finance. The IMF continues to take a firm line, insisting that new loans be contingent on settling $9.4 billion in arrears and on deep cuts to government salaries, perks and agricultural subsidies. I hope Theresa May and Boris Johnson make a decisive move in Zimbabwe's direction. The UK has a long relationship and it's about time that they've mended it, I think. And uh, I, whilst I appreciate uh, Manangagwa was kind of, what do you call it, a manufactured coup, but nevertheless, I think he's saying the right things, he's trying to move in the right direction, and the UK should now step up. And step up. Um, November 2017, I wrote about how the genie is out of the bottle in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's total foreign debt, according to Nick Branson, uh, when encompassing public and private obligations, reached $11.5 billion at the end of last year. Domestic debt on the rise, hitting $6.9 billion by the end of 2017. All told, it apparently amounts to 95% of Zimbabwe's GDP. China, according to a tweet I saw from ZIFF News, has written off Zimbabwe's debt to the Asian giants and institutions. I've got more clarity on that. Zimbabwe wants mining companies to list on the local exchange. Interestingly, this is one of the proposals I made many years ago to President Kabila. When he took me to visit uh, in, in Kinshasa, there is a building within the State House grounds, and there was a screen, and he points out that the screen was frozen and broken and on it. And Duos du He said, rehabilitate that. Demands for clarity on Zambia's national debt are intensifying as the standoff with the IMF continues and senior figures in government fear a Zimbabwe-style economic crisis and currency crash. They say that contrary to official figures, the debt now stands at 100% of GDP. Clearly, but President Mungu is not listening. South African all share is down 6.29% year to date. Dollar versus Rand, we've popped over 12 into my buy zone again. Look at buying the RAN. Nigerian all shares up 6.88% year to date. Ghana is considering selling bonds from China to Japan as the country prepares to issue as much as $2.5 billion in foreign currency debt this year. We have Sukuk, Samurai, and Andamal in the mix. $2.5 billion envelope, they said. Ghana's stock exchange composite index is the world's best. It's up 31.36% year to date. 2nd of April, I wrote a piece where I, one of the conclusions I was saying is one of the challenges Africa faces on the world stage is consolidating 55 voices into one. Uh, 3rd of April, I was talking about African market performance, and I said when you look around the world, you will note that Africa is outperforming, and I expect this to remain an overarching theme in 2018. And then I wrote a piece for the Turkish TRT, is free trade silver bullet for African prosperity? David Pilling, in an article in the FT, says something is already happening. Intra-African trade, which while still low, has risen 11-fold since 1990. It's an interesting point to Renaissance. Beauty within chaos. These are photographs from South Sudan cattle camps via um, the AFP. Uganda welcomed 1.3 million international visitors in 2016. And on that note, have a look at this. This is Ruizori National Park. Hikers can try to summit Mount Stanley's Margarita Peak, the third highest point in Africa, the highest point in Uganda, the DR Congo. This is Botswana's new Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry, uh, Bogolo Kenewendo. It's got everyone's attention. Tanzania's economy grew 7.1% last year, beating the government's own revised forecasts of the Prime Minister. What was interesting is fully a GDP growth in 2017 was driven by mining and quarrying 17.5%. I'd like to see more detail around that mining number. Of course, Acacia mining is a good example of quite a lot of hullabaloo in that mining sector. Discussed global economic trends with Michael Corbett, the CEO of Citigroup, who called on me at State House this morning. That was yesterday. CFC standing PMI is at 55.7. It's been on a steady recovery. Nissan plans to start assembling vehicles in Kenya. All these car makers have come to assemble cars. They're talking about um, 
assembling one ton pickup vehicles, Kenya's new vehicle market is dominated by light commercial trucks. One ton single cab trucks made up almost 12% of all new purchases in Kenya last year. Kenya Mortgage Finance Refinance Company, which is to be owned by the state, commercial banks and financial cooperatives, has been set up a mortgage refinancing company to help meet the government's aim of providing 500,000 houses in five years. Kenya has an estimated 200,000 annual housing shortfall, which is expected to rise to 300,000 by 2020. Housing finance in Kenya remains below its potential, the Treasury said. KMRC is expected to be licensed by the Central Bank in February with initial debt financing of $160 million from the World Bank. Kenya had just 24,458 mortgage loans valued at $2 billion or 3.15% of GDP in 2015, compared with about 30% of GDP worth of outstanding mortgages in South Africa. Standard Chartered is up 10.096% year to date. I look forward to interviewing Lanin, the CEO, next week, and we'll post that on Rich TV. But interesting, look at that, up 10%, and then the PLC, Standard Chartered, is down 8.17% year to date. Barclays, that's up 34.895% year to date. Uh, Barclays Africa is down 0.74%. And Barclays PLC is up just 2.12%. The theme I'm trying to show is the outperformance of the frontier businesses versus the core parent companies. Barclays, of course, is divesting. KCB is up 25.146% year to date. Equity Bank is up 37.106% year to date. All the share price data is on which wrap up so you're interested in diving into some of these top performing shares. EABL is up 7.142% uh, year to date. Diageo is down 10.83%. Safari Com hit a fresh all time high. That's up 22.429% year to date versus Vodafone, which is minus 16.08%. Total Kenya, one of the best performing shares in the stock market, is up 42.55% year to date. Um, I got in a fairly robust debate with the editor of the Nation about um, uh, the share price performance. But have a look at this five-year chart, standard newspapers compared with Nation Media. This is from Wazua. Kenya shillings at 101. Nairobi all shares up 14.82% year-to-date at a fresh record. And the NSC 20s lagging. The all shares up just 3.36%. I wish you a fabulous weekend. Thank you for stopping by.